in our society, the thing we are aiming at is free choice. The freedom to choose the things we want to buy. And always to have many things to choose from. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Decrypting Crypto podcast, a CastBox original show. I'm Austin Knight, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Matthew Housebarby. Hey, Austin, and thanks to everyone listening. If this is your first time listening, welcome to the podcast. If you're a continued listener, thanks for continuing to support the show and listening to me and Austin ramble on every week. (laughs) We've got plenty more rambling for you uh, this week, we promise. Following on from last week's episode, uh, we're going to continue with our format of rounding up some recent news and then digging into one topic as our main feature. So exciting stuff here. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this one. So this piece, uh, this episode, should I say, is where we're actually going to do our first ever project deep dive, right? Yeah, so we're going to take one blockchain project and go into detail about how it works, what it's trying to do, and then generally give you an unbiased overview of what it's all about. Yeah, we've, we have had a lot of guests on, and while they'll always try to be unbiased. And I think a lot of our guests, we've tried to make that very clear. They're ultimately often talking about their own project. So it is tough. You're not going to just shit on your own project, right? And (laughs) I think with, with this format, we actually do all of the research ourselves and just simply share our thoughts and understanding of both how the project works and what we generally think about it. Yeah, exactly. And we're acting as people that don't really have a dog in this fight. So hopefully mm. for you as the listener, the end result will be that it'll educate you about a project and maybe pique your interest to learn a little bit more about it on your own. Right. And at this point, I also want to clarify, we have no affiliation with the projects that we're talking about. We haven't received any compensation to talk about them, nor will we ever do that. That's basically, the whole point of this podcast is to deliver unbiased information. And if we do see things that we don't necessarily agree with in the project or think there could be areas of improvement, we'll actually highlight them and... Yeah, we, we we don't have a dog in the fight, right? This is all about us just simply taking an unbiased view. Yeah, and for that matter, in the spirit of discourse and transparency, if anyone from one of these projects is listening and disagrees with the things that we've said or maybe agrees with what we've said, you can reach out to us on Twitter at The Coin Offering and we'll chat about it. Yeah, we're always available on Twitter. You can... Email us at podcast at thecoinoffering.com if you'd rather get in touch more privately. But before we go into our main feature, where we're going to be talking in great detail about the project Sire and its cryptocurrencies, Sire Coin and Sire Funds, let's just talk about a few recent developments in the blockchain space first. So the first piece of news is all around Shapeshift. And Twitter has honestly been all over this one. Austin, (laughs) I know you're a big fan of Shapeshift. Uh, That's shapeshift.io, the website. And I think we've actually talked about them previously on the podcast. Yeah, I think that was in series one where we were discussing the different places to buy and sell cryptocurrencies and how you can sort of transfer from fiat currency to one cryptocurrency Mm -hmm. and then from cryptocurrency to another cryptocurrency via Shapeshift. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And, uh, well, the news itself, right, and we'll explain why this is kind of important, is Shapeshift just announced in the past couple of weeks that they'd now be requiring all users of Shapeshift to create an account on Shapeshift before they can trade. So previously, you didn't need to sign up. You just basically said which cryptocurrencies you have, which you want to trade it for, you send the cryptocurrency to the address and it processes the transaction. Now you're going to need an account. And what this means is that they'll actually be complying with KYC. That's know your customer and AML anti-money laundering rules. Yeah. Yeah. So, and Eric Voorhees, right The And this, I think this is why it's so controversial because you may be thinking right now, well, okay, what's the big deal here? And, um, 
Eric Voorhees, the Shapeshift CEO, who is honestly a true industry OG. If you read anything about blockchain, Eric's name comes up. He's a great person to follow on Twitter. While I may not necessarily agree with all of his opinions, I think it's, he's an interesting character to listen to and has some very interesting thoughts. He's a very public libertarian and has spoken in the past about really separating consumer finances from state surveillance. So this really is likely a bitter pill for him to swallow because it the, the, the feeling that we get here is that it seems like he's been forced down this route. Eric has been, let's say, in trouble with the SEC previously. And I think he's probably realized that resistance is futile to a certain extent to keep his company going. But a lot of people have been coming out on Twitter and we'll share some of these tweets in the show notes in criticism of Eric. But I know, Austin, we've talked a bit about general like KYC, anti-money laundering and general regulation. And I'm not even sure if this is a bad thing, right? Yeah, I think that we, per usual, probably feel that there is a happy middle ground that we could, mm -hmm. that Shapeshift could, or any blockchain piece of technology that is dealing with regulation versus decentralization yeah. could arrive at here. Yeah, and I think people that are very much huge proponents of blockchain technology, and in particular, decentralization... I personally feel sometimes can get a little too hung up on the anonymity and privacy side of things. I think that is absolutely a huge advantage. I think when we talk about gaining widespread adoption for cryptocurrency, I, like Rome wasn't built in a day, very much that phrase comes to mind in the sense that there are still legal frameworks, there are processes in place. We have not just flicked a switch and moved to a whole new world where all of a sudden we can completely transform every nuance of the financial services sector and the way in which we just kind of separate ourselves away from the state, as much as that would be wonderful for many, many people. I think there is also the fact that as we've talked about and as some of the guests on the show have talked about, there is also a certain degree of protection that's needed for consumers and accountability from those that are ultimately in the blockchain space to create a profit. We've seen so many ICOs out there. I think we were talking about this uh, in the last episode briefly that ultimately have not necessarily been created in the best interests of the consumer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's going to be interesting to see how that develops. And shapeshift to one side, there's there's also been some interesting comments from Jack Dorsey in the past couple of weeks, right? Yeah, so Jack Dorsey, he's the CEO of Twitter. And recently in a congressional committee meeting that Twitter was involved in, he noted that they were exploring blockchain as a way to verify identities and, quote, fight misinformation scams. Yeah, we talked a bit about social media giants like Facebook talking a lot about blockchain. We were we were chatting a bit before we started recording this episode at Austin, weren't we? And we were talking about how Jack Dorsey came out. I'm trying to remember his exact quote, but basically saying Bitcoin is the currency of the future and he's very pro blockchain. I think it seems like a matter of time before more social media platforms kind of do the same thing. I I guess I wonder when we're actually going to see a big move from one of these companies. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that... Uh, tell us, Austin. Tell <laughs> us when. <laughs> I, I, I think it's all a matter of finding the, uh, you know, a practical application within the context of what the company is already doing, right? And so that's perhaps what's so interesting about Twitter exploring this as a solution to a problem that I think they've always faced and they've attempted to solve in different ways in the past, arguably without success. So yeah. for Jack Dorsey to say, like he literally said, blockchain is one that I think has a lot of untapped potential, specifically around distributed trust and distributed enforcement potentiality. That's really interesting. That's, that's, a, that's a real use case. How they mm. plan to do that is, <laughs> that could become <laughs> a, a completely different 
discussion and sort of debate around whether or not that would even be healthy for the platform in the first place and whether how important anonymity is to, to Twitter as a whole. But uh, I think it is interesting to hear people in mainstream companies at the helm of mainstream companies exploring this technology as, as solutions to their pre-existing problems. Yeah, I agree. It's a shining, real shining testimonial, at least for blockchain from someone of Jack Dorsey's stature. Obviously, also CEO of Square and Square have been dabbling in with some of their Square Pay uh, functionality, adding Bitcoin functionality at some point to accept Bitcoins from your retail stores, things like that. So I I think we are going to see this being applied. I I don't necessarily buy that the first ways we're going to start seeing this is through payments. It, it seems like with the added importance around fake news and verifiable identities, the blockchain's immutable ledger seems like the perfect use case for Twitter and Facebook. We're also investing heavily, also giving shining testimonials of blockchain as well to to start using this this technology as well. So we'll see. Yeah, I think that uh, just as we had originally observed in season one, this space is still very nascent and being defined. Um, and it's an interesting technology uh, with a lot of people poking at how it can be applied. Uh, and it, it, yeah, it will be cool to see how that actually shakes out in the end. It certainly will. All right, let's move on to our main feature section before we ramble on all day long. (laughs) Yeah, today we're going to be taking a deep dive into Saya. Okay, so before people get on our asses on Twitter, it is pronounced (laughs) Saya. It's spelled S-I-A. It's not Sia. We, 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 We have clarified this and we ourselves have been saying this wrong for a long, long time. <laughs> so we're making amends now, just to clear the air there. Yes. Uh, Austin, why don't you give like a brief introduction to what Sia is? Yeah, so Sia is a blockchain-based cloud storage solution. You could think of it as a decentralized version of Google Drive or Dropbox or iCloud or Amazon Drive. Take your pick. <laughs> uh, David Vorick, a former software developer at IBM, is the CEO of Nebulous, which is the company that runs the Sia project. And they're actually based in Boston, so we have some common roots there. Yeah, yeah, just down the road from where I am, actually. <laughs> and and on the Sia website, so just to kind of like read here, I think actually I took this from their LinkedIn page because it was a bit more concise. So this is how the team describes the the project and the platform. So Sia is a new approach to cloud storage platforms. Sia is a decentralized network of data centers that, taken together, comprise the world's fastest, cheapest, and most secure cloud storage platform. Actually, not a crazy amount of jargon in there for once, which uh, (laughs) is a refreshing change. Ultimately, what we're talking about here, right, is like, yeah, like, Dropbox on the blockchain is is probably the best way to think about Sire. And there is a bunch of competitors to Sire, albeit not a huge amount, but some that I would pull out is Storage, S-T-O-R-J, uh, MadeSafe, Gollum, Filecoin. And Filecoin, I think we talked about Filecoin in series one. Maybe I'm making this up, but <laughs> at the time, which was uh, around September 2017, Filecoin like broke the record for the largest ICO in terms of the amount they raised. It was 257 million. I mean, nothing now compared to the 4 billion that EOS raised in their <laughs> ICO. But at the time, I think this really did kick on a big part of the ICO boom, which yeah. was pretty much starting around that time, right? Yeah, the SIA project was first conceived at Hack MIT in 2013. Uh, it works by chopping up encrypted fragments of data and spreading them around multiple hosts. So if you want to access your files, the fragments are then recompiled and made accessible as normal. So you could think of it as being very similar to BitTorrent, but a little bit more secure. Mm. Yeah, if anyone listening has used BitTorrent before, I'm sure you've never illegally downloaded a movie. But if you have, you'll know that the way that works is the 
torrent file kind of gets broken up into fragments. You use cedars and there's like leeches that connect up to the host and it recompiles this file that is made up of a ton of different fragments. The main advantage here with, with Sire is it's distributed in a decentralized network, which makes it incredibly secure. So before we get too bogged down into this, it's worth probably just having a, a brief chat about the, the cloud storage space in general. This is actually a really fucking huge space, right? It's an enormous <laughs> industry. Yeah, so the cloud storage market, it's expected to grow from $30.7 billion in 2017, as if that wasn't already large enough, to <laughs> $88.91 billion in 2022. So just over the course of a few years, this is going to balloon in terms of the revenue that's being uh, generated because more and more things are, are being stored in the cloud, more businesses are operating in the cloud. Uh, something useful yeah. to note about this is that Dropbox recently, as of March 2018, IPO'd raising $756 million, which is one of the largest tech IPOs ever. Yeah. And their current market cap is $10.85 billion. That's just one player in the cloud storage market. Yeah, I know for the past probably like 10 years now, people have been talking about when is Dropbox going to IPO? When is Dropbox going to IPO? And it was eagerly awaited. I mean, so far, it's early days, their, their stock has been pretty well received. But in, in the grand scheme of things, yeah, they're a big player in the space, but nowhere near the size of... I mean, Apple are one of the huge players in this space, right? Yeah. With that iCloud product, they just became a trillion-dollar company. So <laughs> that's uh, that's pretty big. But in in the tradition... Let, let's just call it kind of like traditional cloud storage space for now. Uh, here's kind of some of the disadvantages that you could look at at some of the current technologies that aren't running via a blockchain cloud storage system or a decentralized cloud storage system. So first of all, you've got the fact that typically, this is usually the case, but not always, the data isn't actually encrypted. One huge piece, which is nearly always the case, is that it's often housed, all of the data, right, it's often housed in one legal jurisdiction and is actually owned by one single entity. That does definitely create a huge honeypot for someone to hack into and get access to huge amounts of data. And because of the added risk that these individual companies take on and have to build these platforms themselves, consumers will often pay a premium on this. Like it's a gated platform. They need to often pay like a membership to be a part of it. And the final point of the, this is, and honestly, I do think this also applies to a certain extent for decentralized platforms though is the motives of the company like may not necessarily align with those of the consumer i think within centralized cloud storage platforms there's certainly an incentive for companies to do things with consumers data that maybe consumers would not necessarily want to be done with their data that doesn't necessarily mean that they will but there is an incentive there to do that right on the flip side, some advantages of decentralized cloud storage are, first off, individual consumers have complete ownership of their data. So the need for trust is eliminated. And the distributed network removes any of the honeypots and it dramatically increases security in doing that. Yeah, it seems like the big piece here is right, you, you actually have ownership of your data. When you're storing data on something like iCloud or Dropbox, right, you, you don't own that data anymore. And if there's something that the celebrity iCloud hacking scandal taught us, it's that sometimes you want to own your own <laughs> data, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it should it's a fairly like simple and straightforward concept, but of course, you know, executing it in practice and determining where you're going to to store your data, that that can be difficult. You don't always know what's happening at that centralized entity or company that's keeping your stuff. Uh, and I think that that could be the appeal of something like Saya is that it's much more transparent and straightforward in, in terms of like where your stuff is going and who has, or for that matter, doesn't have control <laughs> and influence over it. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's fair to say, and we'll come into this when we start uh, discussing some of the challenges that platforms like Sire probably have. Like the the big advantages here seem to be more on the technical side. So like security, yeah. ownership, and co. Whereas when you look at some of the more centralized, well, the centralized traditional cloud storage space, the way they kind of really gain a foothold here is by providing a really great user experience and building trust that way. But we'll park that for now because I just want us to briefly summarize for our listeners like how Sire works. We're not going to get too technical here, but let's just kind of kick off and we'll, we'll kind of like go through this maybe step by step, Austin. We've tried to outline yeah. this in a simple way, but why don't you like kick off the first part of the process of how Sire works? Yeah. So Matt and I are still wrapping our heads around this, but this is what we <laughs> know about how that Sire actually works. First and foremost, the process involves two parties: the renter and the host. The renter is the consumer, so the person who wants to have their data stored in the cloud. And the host is a member of the SIA network who makes storage space available to the community. So what the host is doing is they're actually renting out spare storage space on their hard drive and allowing the renter to place their data in that space. Right, and the, the key piece here is like these two parties they for them to actually work together and for you to store your your data using some of the the storage space of the host you need to participate in what sire calls a file contract and and a file contract is a kind of like a smart contract but published on the sire blockchain and we've we've talked all through smart contracts in in a real detailed level in uh, I think it was episode eight of series one where we were chatting about Ethereum. If you haven't checked that out, I would highly recommend doing that. And within the file contract, it contains the terms of the agreement between the renter and the host. So an agreement would be like how long you're going to store the, the data for, how much data is going to be stored and how much you're going to agree on as a price. And the, the, the real advantage of this approach is it actually eliminates the need for trust. You're just setting rules within a smart contract. The terms of the agreement are, are enforced kind of in an impartial and trustless way. Yeah. A cool part of this is that the renter is able to set a budget for how much they want to spend, and then the amount is locked into that file contract. And then the renter's wallet picks 50 hosts, which best fit the renter's budget constraints. So prices for renters are roughly around $2 per terabyte per month, which is fantastic. But mm -hmm. there's a catch. The, the price is agreed in Sia coin, so it could fluctuate yeah. a lot with the market price after a file contract has been agreed, and it's kind of difficult to go back on that. <laughs> Austin, you're telling me there's fluctuations in <laughs> cryptocurrency? I don't believe it. Yeah, I mean, if <laughs> just just looking at the price of of Sia coin as we're recording, it's under one cent. It's like half of a cent, roughly, in USD, and. I mean, going back to, I think, around December time of 2017, it got to points where it was close to the $10 mark. I mean, if you set up a file contract around then, you would have significantly overpaid yeah. for your storage, and then you're locked into a contract. Now, I think that's a challenge of price volatility, something we talk about quite a lot in, in crypto, and certainly... For now, that's going to be a real blocker. But when you actually compare it to, let's just take roughly two dollars. They they do reset the the price in Sirecoin to usually match around about two dollars per terabyte. And if you compare that to Dropbox, right? So you're looking at nine dollars ninety nine, pretty much ten bucks per month per terabyte to store on their platform. And Apple via iCloud charges. The same amount, so like nine ninety nine in USD per month for two terabytes. They actually don't offer one terabyte. So let's even just say they charge five bucks per terabyte, right? For argument's sake, that's still more than double what Sirecoin are, are charging on a just yeah. straight 
like for like level. Yeah. So this is a classic case where the technology itself is very interesting, but the unpredictability of the currency that is powering <laughs> it can kind of make the technology look a little bit less attractive. Uh, I think it's important to separate those two things, at least for now. 100%. So the, the, the final part of the file contracts, right, is you've got, well, there's two final parts. So the first part, you've got the host who's serving up the storage space. They actually lock in some Sirecoin into the file contract. The main reason why they do this is just in case, well, to basically only allowing or ensuring that good actors will participate. If you're locking in funds into a file contract, which you'll get back if you hold up your end of the bargain, it means that you like you have a vested interest in participating by the rules and it will avoid just people who have nothing to lose potentially doing harm to the network. Yeah. And then finally, some small fees are paid. These constitute roughly 3.9% of the renter's allowance and 3.9% of the host collateral. So these are paid to holders of SIA's second cryptocurrency, SIA Fund. Mm. So yeah. <laughs> interesting dynamic there, Matt. Can you sort of explain to yeah. us what SIA Fund is and how that works? Yeah, this really confused me when I was first looking into SIA because they have SIA Coin, which is the, the native cryptocurrency of the SIA network, and then they have SIA Fund. And it, it sounds weird when you kind of talk about it like this. Okay, well, what? These fees are going to another cryptocurrency. Actually, this is a, in my opinion at least, a very good and interesting concept. So similarly to two other projects that do a, a kind of similar thing, Dash and Cardano, Sire aims to actually fund itself by levying small fees. So we, we talked about these fees that are taken from the renter and the host. They go into Sire funds and there's a total of 10,000 Sire funds that, that have been pre-mined. They're out in distribution. And Nebulous, which is Sire's parent company, it owns around eight and a half thousand of these with the remainder of those having been sold in the ICO in 2014. I'll, I'll, I'll come into that in a moment. But the income that they generate by Sire funds is primarily used to aid the development of Sire. So that's all used there without having to rely on donations. That's one of the biggest challenges in the space when you're doing things where you're not taking kind of a slice of the pie is like you have to rely on donations, which is often unpredictable, is really difficult from a scaling point of view, especially when competitors come into the fray. And more than anything, like as more people actually use Sire's file contracts, more fees are paid, frees up available resources, and then the Sire team can do better work. But also it's probably worth us just touching back on the, the fact they actually did an ICO for SIA funds at, at one point, right? Yeah. So the, an ICO was completed for SIA funds, but not for SIA coins. Uh, that ICO in 2014 sold 1,135 SIA fund at about a half a Bitcoin. So that was around $190 at the time. Oh, those were the days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically the long and short here is they've separated out the token in Sirecoin that's used to ultimately fund and power the network and be used for transactions with this Sire fund coin, which is purely used to aid the development of the platform itself. I almost kind of think about this as like the checking and the savings account of uh, the Sire team. You've got the Sire fund, which is like the savings account, which all these fees go into and is used to purely just fund development. Then you've got like the checking account where it's like these transactions are flowing to, to create these agreements, these file contracts with users and actually power this whole system. Yeah. But it's not just Sire Fund and that we mentioned they're all pre-mined. Like Sirecoin, the cryptocurrency that's actually used on the platform to create these file contracts, that can actually be mined. Yeah. Right? And it uses proof of work. Maybe we we just briefly touch on that as well. Because there's some big drama that's gone on around Sirecoin relatively recently as well that we're going to touch into. Yeah. 
So it can be mined. It uses, as you mentioned, proof of work. The current block reward is around 150,000 SC or SIA coin. And like Bitcoin, a new block is created every 10 minutes. It's one of the few cryptocurrencies that actually doesn't have a limited supply though. So interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. I, f I find that I, I actually am not so familiar in all honesty with like how that economic model worked. Maybe we'll try and get someone from the SIA team on to talk to us a bit about that because uh, scarcity is something that we've, we've talked about a lot. As like a fundamental piece of what makes a currency. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we talked about that literally the last episode, yeah. right? So I'm super interested to understand like why and how that works. Yeah. Same here. There was some huge drama when SIA planned to launch its own ASIC miner via Obelisk, though, as Matt yeah. sort of hinted to earlier here. Matt, do you want to tell us about what unfolded there? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's unlike the blockchain space to have much drama, right? Uh. <laughs> yeah. Usually everything is very stable and quiet here. <laughs> Yeah, this was a, I know, a big blow for the, the SIA team. The SIA team, actually, I have to say, I love following their team. They they push out some really cool content. Um, and a few of the teams speak at conferences I've seen and heard from them uh, a few times. And they seem like genuinely really nice people. And the community is one of the few communities that I've seen, especially within like Reddit. And I think they have a Discord channel as well. It seems to be very generally very accepting and not too much of this kind of like uh, drama filled, like aggressive community that some projects have facilitated. But this, this is probably testing the community quite a lot right now. So earlier on in 2018, the SIA team announced that they would be launching in tandem with the company Obelisk, its own ASIC miner. So we've talked a bit about mining and an ASIC miner in short, if you don't know what this is, is a, a piece of hardware that is specifically built to perform one single task, right? And that task is to be incredibly efficient at mining a certain cryptocurrency or a certain set of cryptocurrencies. Previously, ASIC miners weren't operating on the SIA uh, network so which which basically means that you could have lower spec hardware and like you could use just a standard pc and you'd be able to mine sire coin pretty well i when i was playing around with this near the end of last year i was just using an old pc that i had in my apartment that i dug up and i was like oh, i'll stick that in and i was mining a bunch of sire coin every day and then the moment asics came on it was like okay well that computer doesn't work anymore <laughs> um but the community actually largely funded the creation of Obelisk, uh, which is this company that used to create the ASIC mine of Cycoin. They were promising, hey, you know, like we're going to put this at a reasonable price. Performance is going to be great. This is going to, the big advantage for Sire is that it will add more hash rate to the network, makes it more secure. It's better for everyone in the long term, arguably. A lot of people are very anti ASIC, so I don't want to get Twitter on fire already. Uh, and the problem was Bitmain, that tiny little Chinese company <laughs> that we every now and then talk about, caught wind of this and using its clout and ultimately superior hardware development and research team, built their own SIA miner, ASIC miner that was, launched it ahead of time, which... <laughs> really hurt the ultimately the the community that funded the ASIC miner fire obelisk but on top of that when the obelisk miner did launch later than planned which should have hopefully then beat out bitmain's processing power and ability to mine it was very underwhelming and it basically meant the long and short was it was impossible for miners to make a profit and as a result, the SIA team uh, and community are currently planning, I don't know whether they've confirmed this or they're just exploring this right now, but looking at forking the SIA network to ultimately make the Bitmain miners redundant. But yeah, there's been a lot of price volatility around SIA dropping off a cliff. I mean, we're also seeing that across a lot of cryptocurrencies right now, right? But this seems a lot more of a concern for the, the, the SIA 
project and community. Yeah. So that's a pretty good overview, I think, of what SIA does, how it works, and some of the challenges that they're dealing with today, some of the things that they're thinking about. If we want to kind of just wrap this up, like what what is the future of SIA and where could it go? What are some of the challenges that they're they're going to be up against in summary? I think that the first thing that we've kind of observed here is that they're up against some industry giants. We mentioned big names, Dropbox, Amazon, Apple, that they're competing with. At the same time, they have superior pricing in one respect, but of course it fluctuates a lot, so it's a little bit less yeah. stable. And they also have an interesting value proposition from the technology side of things with yeah. the data being fully decentralized and within the owner's control. At the same time, the UX for accessing the system isn't really even close to what an everyday user of those big names would expect. So it's still going to be very confusing for people that aren't in the crypto or blockchain space to get their heads around this service. And I think that this is a recurring theme for us is, it is. that we see is. a lot of amazing technology that could be disruptive to pre-existing and incredibly well-established organizations. But there is an aspect of volatility and then there's an aspect of difficulty of access and use that mm. the incumbents don't deal with today. There's yep. also, per usual, some legal challenges, of course. That, that <laughs> Just that, a few, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In terms of liability around storing like illegal content via the SIA network. A lot is still unknown here. We we think that they should be okay in the US, but elsewhere in the world, things are less clear. Yeah, and I, I think if there's one thing that we've learned from especially the past couple of years in the general tech space is that regulation is starting to catch up. Yeah, We've seen a lot absolutely. of the, especially in Europe, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's things like the GDPR regulations. There's been new directives around copyright that have been coming out specifically made for the web. We're miles away from building out specific legislation that accounts for blockchain technology right now, especially on a file storage level. And yeah, like what happens if I upload uh, copyright material onto the SEER network or if someone uploads pornography or something illegal, right? Like who is liable for that because I'm not housing it on my machine. I'm not necessarily housing it on like a central SIA server. It's distributed across a number of people's. That was, I have no idea where liability yeah. uh, comes into play there. I mean, you could, you could imagine there being like this terrible nightmare scenario of like, if the, the host were to work with a renter and the, the renter put something, <laughs> you know, in that, that right. sort of fragment of, hard drive that they allowed them to use that was illegal, could our terrible, outdated, bureaucratic system somehow mm. find the the host in a weird roundabout way liable for that? I doubt that that would be something that would actually happen in practice. It's irrational. But yeah, I think that it, it points to the major challenges and questions that are that have to be discussed with a, a distributed file system like this. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think only time will start to tell. I'm sure as we've seen in probably, I, I would, I would argue the most interesting space in the past 30 years has been around file storage, like the rise of ultimately kind of what this is to a certain extent. This is a decentralized version of like Napster, right? It's a peer to peer file storage and sharing platform in, in, in some respects. And what we saw with the rise of both Napster and BitTorrent was regulators didn't really understand the technology. Content creators were pissed off. And as a result, they made examples of yeah. a few individuals. I still remember when like 
people, just everyday consumers, like their kid yeah. had downloaded an MP3 of a some song, and they were now in their parents were in court. They had no idea what was going $250, on. Two hundred fifty thousand dollar fine. Oh. The FBI knocking down doors. LimeWire. LimeWire was Lime fined Wire, for yeah. more money than existed in the world at the time. <laughs> Like that is just a perfect <laughs> write them a check. That's like that's like a headline out of the onion. <laughs> it really it really is. <laughs> but but this is the this is the challenge, right? It's like and I think that there have been some lessons learned on three layers, right? It's like the consumer level being more aware of this, the the business and the corporations entering these spaces and then i think also to a certain extent the regulatory and enforcement bodies probably learning a few lessons from the backlash out of some of that but it still represents a problem because if the copyright holders of material let's just let's just go down the copyright angle versus the illegal content mm -hmm. angle to begin with right it's like they they are potentially losing out right and who who is there to compensate them? And that's an interesting question. But hey, we'll we'll see. I do think though, to take a step back on the one of the previous points you said, the user experience piece is is, is very important. I think a lot of people that are very much avid supporters in the cryptocurrency and blockchain space are st are overlooking this to a certain extent yeah, uh, because they are technical in themselves. But I think that's a that's a good discussion piece for us to maybe dig into in a future episode yeah. because it's we, we we talk about this all the time, right? Yep, and we also know that the, while they are in the absolute minority, uh, there are a couple players in this space. We've we've even had some of them on as guests on mm. the show that have recognized the importance of user experience and design for widespread adoption and ultimate success of the their project. So people are doing it, and it's been wor it works very well for the people that are, are focusing on it. But of course, like because the space is still so nascent, as we've said so many times, the focus is generally on the technology, and, and the end result is that it's very interesting technology that is utterly unusable. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I, and I don't think by any means that's what we're saying about Saya, but a general theme in the, the industry is, is definitely being that. But just to wrap things up here, I do think that Sire is a very interesting project. I think uh, as an application, blockchain or decentralized cloud storage is is a, a really, really useful application of blockchain technology. We're, we're seeing unprecedented levels of data breaches on a daily basis now, and the cloud is largely contributing to a lot of that. So what I would just say is, Go read up, go use Sire. Uh, go let us know what you think about it. Make sure you tweet us at the coin offering. And as we mentioned, if anyone from the Sire team agrees, disagrees, wants to <laughs> publicly shame us for misinformation, <laughs> feel free to reach out to us. And uh, until next time, we'll, we'll see you on the show. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to show your appreciation to me and Austin, make sure you subscribe and leave us a review on the CastBox app or on your favorite podcasting platform. We'd really appreciate it. If you haven't already, make sure you download the free CastBox app where you'll find us as one of the CastBox original shows. You can also visit thecoinoffering.com to learn more about cryptocurrencies, get caught up on some news, see how your currency is performing, and you can finally follow us on Twitter at The Coin Offering. Lastly, but not leastly, you can ask us any questions you have by emailing us at podcast at thecoinoffering.com. The Decrypting Crypto Podcast is a CastBox original show, and its content should not be used and are not intended as investment advice. Please do your own due diligence before making any investment, cryptocurrency or otherwise.